Bear, my favorite people on earth. Grant Riding Unicorns, you are in for a treat today. I have Holly Rustic as our guest. She is the founder of Grant Riding and Funding. When I was first getting started trying to figure out how I'm going to teach grants online, she was the website I often looked at and be like, okay, she's doing it. Like, it's possible, right? And fast forward, now we are friends that are often bantering back and I for some ideas, and I'm just so excited for you to hear her story. I actually didn't know her origin story, how she fell into grant writing in the first place. She is truly a global citizen. She has the biggest heart, and she's really a fascinating and interesting woman to listen to. So buckle up, it's gonna be a great interview. Then we pivot to talk about the nonprofit consulting conference and do a side-by-side -side comparison of our programs. So I think you're going to love it. Without further ado, let's hit it. I'm joined today by an OG in the space, Holly Rustic. This is a conversation well overdue because I don't know why we haven't done this before. I'm ready to party. I got my cappuccino okay. here. You know, I'm doing it real. <laughs> Yay. Cool. I, yes, I had my little OJ, um, OJ and club soda cocktail earlier. So, you know, I'm a really big fan of putting regular beverages in fancy glasses for a little extra pizzazz in our day. Oh yeah, you know, this has got like the whole thing on it. So, <laughs> so cute. Okay. Love it. <laughs> so solid. Okay, so take me back to the very beginning. How did you get into grant writing? Oh wow, um, it was a long time ago. So I was actually working in the Middle East. Um, just side note, mm -hmm. I've traveled and worked in different uh, countries for a long time. Actually eight years before I came to Guam in 2011, I was working abroad. And um, when I was there, unfortunately, it was when the Asian tsunami happened. So it was, I was in Kuwait when that happened way back in the day. And um, I saw a job opportunity to help out in Indonesia um, with community development. So I applied, got the job, went there um, and started working. And basically, I didn't even know I was a grant writer until I was, you know, <laughs> later. like it was just yeah. I was working in the community and they were looking at these big because we were just a little startup nonprofit. Right. And they were looking at these big UN organizations that were there, but they all had like their bulletproof glass and guns. And it was like, there's a lot of gatekeepers, like for reals, right? In this, or, yeah. but for us, we were riding our bikes and it was fine. Like we were like in the community <laughs> and they were like, you know, we need some money. So, but we don't know how to approach these organizations. So I started writing, wow. you know, proposals for them and got some money. And I thought, oh my gosh, I love this. And I just felt like a liaison. And I feel like even, you know, in my grant writing business, that's how I felt was a liaison a lot of times, connecting people, yep. connecting yep. resources, right? So that's where I got started. And then I moved outside of DC after that and worked at an actual like uh, uh, virtual grant writing agency. And that was huge. That was back in 2006. So that was like a long time ago to be in that space. And they worked with different um, nonprofits. They really focused on the faith-based nonprofits and, um, you know, all over the world. So it was really interesting at that time because there wasn't a lot of stuff online necessarily, but, you know, you could still write grants online and you can still get clients that way and all of the things. So it really opened my mind. And I, I really liked that you could connect money to mission, right? So it was great. And then from there, I went back abroad. I went to Brussels. I did my master's degree and I just kept writing grants on the side. Oh, like to pay for some of my school. And I thought, hey, this can be a thing, right? So, um, but then I, I did work uh, for a little bit more and then I came to Guam and I worked inside a nonprofit. So that was my time of like being inside and being the grant writer inside and all of that. And it was a really good experience because then, you know, I'd also be the acting executive director when he was off island and all of that. So I really got to see the full motion of inside the nonprofit. So I did that for a number of years until I got to the point where I was like, I'm at the glass ceiling. I'm a single mom. I need some more cash and I need more freedom in my life. Like I can't do this five in the morning till seven at night, no time to really grow or do the things that I want to do. Right. So it was for me, it was like, I need freedom and I need more. I need to break the glass ceiling. Right. So yeah. That's okay. Me. This is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You're truly a global grant writer, literally yeah. Yeah. Kuwait, <laughs> Brussels, DC, Guam. I mean, this is incredible. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you already kind of teed me up for that. Why did that transition happen? Yeah. to go from working in-house to why you decided to grant write consult. So the question is like, did it happen? Did you find that freedom? 
did you get that flexibility you were looking for? I would say yes and no, right? So I definitely, you know, even though I had done it on the side before, I had never really done it seriously as a business. It was still like subcontracting out and stuff like that, right? So, and and the other thing too was, you know, this nonprofit, it was great, but eventually it did get kind of toxic. So it wasn't like I had something set up. So I do recommend people, you know, they can set up things, but I also know there's people like me that just, they need to quit right away or they get laid off or there's things that happen and they need to jump, right? So I was at least prepared to, you know, when I quit my job and then I was able to let all my contacts there at the nonprofit know I was quitting and right away I got jobs from that because people are like, oh, now you're available to write grants. You know what I mean? And I see that does happen (laughs) quite often too. So that was good to have that set up, but it was just like, oh my gosh, now I have to like set this business up. And I didn't really, I was, it was a lot of work and a lot of figuring out, right? To, to, and that's why I like, I love the program that I offer now. Cause I'm like, let me help you with that. Like, let me give you some resources. <laughs> you don't have to do this the hard way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was way too long. So um, definitely it did free up some of that time. But at the same time, I did find myself working a lot of nights, working on the weekend, really trying to figure it out. And, you know, and, and being in that, that place too, that scarcity mindset of like, oh, I got a kid, you know, I think my daughter was like four when I did this, right? So um, it was really like, you know, trying to think of that, like I have to take some risk, but not too much risk, what's risk enough and understanding that and and really working through that, like, can I hire someone? And, and then I did start hiring someone and start building a grant agency. And then I said, I don't like that though. I don't like that model. It just didn't fit for me, right? And so what I really, it was a lot of just figuring out me and what, what I wanted for our life, for my daughter and I, right, and to, what it to look like. So when I really started pulling back, I said, I really want more time. I don't want to work hour per dollar. Like I, even Because even if you quit your job and start a business, a lot of people just start the same replica like, kind of model, right? And that's kind of what I was doing. And I was like, this doesn't work. <laughs> doesn't work because it doesn't give me my why of having more flexibility, right? So um, I had to really dive in and say, what do I want to do? And even being on an island here, we have about, I'm on the island of Guam, and we have about 160,000 people here on the island. And there are more than enough nonprofits to keep me working as a grant writing agency, but I didn't want that model. I wanted to say I want to do online courses, like that was getting fancy back in the day. You know what I mean? Like that was getting like something that was you could do and I could export my knowledge from this island. I could make connections without traveling by using Skype then, right? And then everyone got into Zoom. So it was a good way for me to say, I want to reposition the model of my business so I'm not held up on my time per dollar, right? And I know you can do that in other ways, but for me it was creating more passive income and creating other structures. So yeah. Okay, I'd love to know if you actually call the course business passive income because I'm like, there's it's yeah, anything yeah. but passive. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like that's the flaw. It's that's like it's thing. not. It's totally, yeah. You will market forever. You know, you might not keep. You know, then you're gonna be updating things too. It is definitely not passive, but it's a different no. structure, but right? Different. Right. It's like yeah, come with yeah. another word for it, right? I don't know totally. if you have another name for it, but like yeah. how that yeah. operates, right? Yeah. But so did passive. you? Did you end up running those businesses in parallel for a while where you still had your consulting business and then you were also figuring out how to build a, a course? What was that journey like and when was there a transition? Did you Do you not consult anymore? You know, um, I have one client that I've been at there from their beginning that I will occasionally write a grant for. Like, you know, but I'm not in a fixed contract with them. It is just more like that's... That's what I've chosen to do, but that's it. And I think I, in 2020, I stopped taking clients. So I really got serious and I, I stopped really taking. I had a few, but I was just like, I'm going to just pull the line and say no, right? So I did have that um, that switch and it was a lot you know, of mindset and building things up just to be like, if I really want to focus on this, I don't want to be focusing on both. And I was just kind of burned out grant writing too. I was, I was like, I don't mind. I like teaching other people how to do it, but actually getting in and doing the work, it's just not lighting me up anymore. And it's just the whole thing is just like burning me out completely. So, okay. So I've got a juicy question on this because one thing I've wondered about too is because consulting is, is, and can be very demanding without Mm -hmm. boundaries, value-based pricing, other things that you and I are big proponents for now. Mm -hmm. 
but didn't always understand at the time. Yeah. So do you feel some conflict around teaching people how to build freelance grant writing businesses, but then yourself not like loving the business model? And like, how have you kind of like bridged that gap? That's such a good question. I, you know, and but I think it goes back to what you just pointed out is I was doing some things back then that I, now I know not to do. And you know what I right. mean? Like, so even with this right. one client that I have now, it's like, we have really clear boundaries. Right. And we, and I operate in that way. So yeah, I mean, sometimes I do think like I'm kind of out of it and you know, in that way out of that business and I'm in a different one, but I still feel like I can then have the energy to talk about it. And I can really have the, the perspective, the bird's eye view of having been in it and now being on like, seeing it from the outside so I have the time to coach you know what I mean like I have the brain totally, space. totally. yeah I mean I had the same complex in some ways around like oh don't I have to keep a project going at all times just so I'm staying super fresh and I and I've come to realize I'm like wait a minute I'm looking at like 15 to 18 different very specialized coaching call questions twice a month plus all the community questions which are in the hundreds so I'm like I'm staying fresh You're staying with, fresh. without having to be right. But, with, but there was this, there is something about feeling like you still want to be like in the thick of it and, and doing a project. And fu funny enough, every time I took on a project, I'd end up giving it to one of my customers anyway, eventually just being like, all right, I don't have the time to keep this running. Would you like this contract? Here you go. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, one thing I'm totally curious about too is when you did, when you did have your consulting business, I think sometimes my members, if they're in a rural place, they think like, yes, but where am I going to find clients? And you've clearly did it when you were even in Guam. Did you have customers that were off the island? And can you tell me about how you found those clients? Yeah, you know, and this even goes back to the agency I was talking about back in 2006. Like, people have been doing this. It's not a new thing, right? You know what I mean? I mean, it is right. new in art, yes, in the 2000s and internet and all of that. But I mean, it's not like just from COVID. Like, people have been doing this for a while. And a lot of times it was interesting how we found clients back in the day. And I still think this is tried and true. I absolutely do is um like i said he was really focused on faith-based and churches you know that sort of thing the organization so he was even like in the niche space it wasn't you know back then too i remember he was talking to me going you know holly i think if i niche down i'm going to get fewer clients but when he did it was like boom yeah. he blew up because he was so focused and yeah. part of that was because how he could get clients was he would actually we would go physically to conferences for nonprofit leaders right in that space in the faith-based space where there was the decision makers there right and yep. we weren't going to other conferences for grant writers like that's not where you find clients like hello we went to clients you know or we went to conferences that were focused on our clients on our avatar right if you will like on yep. that that person and that's and we would do a little run through we would do like a little funding um hundred dollars for like a little funding analysis just to see like how many grants were in their area for their specific cause and we did this research online and then we would invite them to the breakfast and we would present it to them so it was kind of like wow. i know we talked about on our show that dating right so it was like that dating and um it was a great way and that's where he got a majority of his clients you know so it's so interesting to me because even now for me locally I could still pack out my clients and it wasn't for me like I had to scale from Guam because of my agency like you know what I mean when I was there because there's over I took down all the revenue tax all of the nonprofits here on Guam and there are almost they're like over 800 nonprofits registered yeah. and I don't need 800 <laughs> nonprofits to run a business you know what I mean like you usually just need a handful really if you're charging enough and doing all of the things right so you, you don't in that way there's enough work here but I would still get clients from off island as well coming across my website and that sort of thing so they were definitely finding me online and they still do today and that's why part of the mentorship we have people in there that I vetted that then we have they're available for hire so I just refer them out. I just refer anyone who comes to me out to the grant writers that are under my mentorship program you know what I mean because I still want to give them that but I don't I'm not doing that work any longer um, yeah, so that's how that. we've done it yeah so you can definitely I always think it's like in your communities, that's where you can really go first because you have the no like trust factor there the most, right? But definitely, you're always got to be thinking about where are the decision makers that I want to work with, right? And, mm -hmm. and thinking from that perspective is then, oh, okay, they're attending this thing, they're doing this, that's where I need to be, 
right? So I'm always like to like, go join your chamber of commerces because all of the people there, a lot of them are on boards, right? <laughs> I mean, right. like there they are. No, like, yeah. So like easy things, it's always the low hanging fruit where people want to jump right. and say, but I need to build this huge thing. And we we're talking about this before, like TikTok and LinkedIn and Instagram and all of the places and I need to be there first. And I'm like, no, those are your coldest. Yeah coldest people you want to join you want to look inside your community first even if it's rural do you how many clients do you really need right how many retainers mm-hmm. do you need how many packages do you need like, the food yeah yeah, That's yeah. Exactly right mm-hmm. okay so it's a little bit of a 180 pivot but with ai coming hot on the scene for grant writers i would love to know your opinion on how ai will impact the grant writing profession what's your take oh man it's so interesting um So I think, you know, and I haven't spent a lot of time in it. I'm going to say that, like, I've definitely been looking at it from the perspective of, you know, I've been playing with it and all that, but I have Philip Dang coming on the show to talk about it too, who's like built a whole company on that. But um, from, from my perspective of what I've seen, and, and also like I've been on, I'm on the PTA, so I'm looking at it from like the education perspective too, which is very interesting. Um, but from the grant writing perspective, I think it can really help and assist. I think though, you know, you need to still have your framework and we develop a grants framework. So you have your indicators of what to put inside like a chat GPT or whatever AI tool you're using that will actually generate something. And the main thing I say right now is in, well, we're recording this in um, spring of 2023, there's a lot of data, like if you're trying to get a lot of research on there, it's the, the sites are broken, the URLs are broken. I have found like 80% or higher when I'm doing like trying to do research, they have this beautiful research it shows me and then I click on the link and I go there and the site's gone. You know what I mean? So it's just like, do you really do have to double check it? You do have to look at that. But I think it can help you in more ways than even just writing your grant. Like you could have like, how do I construct this program? Because we're also building business plans, really. You know what I mean? Like, how do I construct this framework? What else would I need to include in it? So you can ask and it's almost just becoming like Google. Like, I think it will become like a Google, like how easily we use Google these days. We'll use ChatGPT in that way or AI in that way to help us like find information and formulate it. So that's kind of my perspective on, I would love to hear your perspective on it though. Yeah. Well, I love that you're talking to Philip Deng at Grantable. That's who we're referencing, co-founder at Grantable. We are big fans of him as well. Um, he's leading the way. And I think it's very important to not inundate yourself with perspectives on AI and overwhelm yourself online. Like find some voices that you respect and follow them. So there's two people I really like, Brooke Markavius. I don't know if I'm going to even say it right. She works at Alibi. Um, and I love Philip Dang. Like he has a, he has a newsletter on LinkedIn, but really has a private podcast, which I love because he's not overly glorifying it. Even as someone who is building a software company using AI for grant writing, he, he's also just in this exploratory curious stage of like what could go wrong in using it in this way. What's great about it? Here's here's another angle to think about things, and I really appreciate that about him. So just a plug for Philip. And my perspective on it is that AI will not take your job. A grant writer using AI will. Yeah, that is my take. AI mm-hmm. will not take your job. A grant writer using AI will. And we yeah. are having an interesting kind of flurry of discussion on it in our community group, where there's definitely some panic. There's this. There's fear. Is this gonna is this gonna make me irrelevant? I'm just getting started. I bet the family farm on being here. And is is it am I gonna be useful? And I can totally understand where those feelings are coming from because mm-hmm. in earlier this year I tried to uh, actually use hire a developer to use ChatGPT to summarize the latest news happening every week, and it didn't go anywhere. It was just not we could not get the the newsletter to work in a way that was like functional enough to be to be useful. And so Mm -hmm. I squashed the project and I also lost a lot of momentum on it. Mm -hmm. And I realized that why I lost momentum wasn't just because it wasn't working out, but it was because my motivation behind doing the newsletter was from a place of fear of also Uh being left behind. And Uh so when I removed and then like spotted that layer of fear and cleared it, that's when I realized I'm like, okay, I can actually just open like my heart and my mind to a curious approach and not needing to have answers. And then what do you know, like Philip with Grantable walks in and you're like, thank you. You you're doing a great job. I'm here to support you. So, exactly. um, so that's my take. I think when you look at everything we teach and everything I'm sure you teach, 
Like, yes, you can plug it in to help with lots of different pieces, but at the end of the day, we're still talking a fraction of what is still the human element of project management and work. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a matter of eliminating a lot of the struggle, leveraging it, learning how to leverage it, not to get frustrated yeah. with the first lousy answer, but how to pull and pull through better answers. But I think yeah. all it kind of comes down to is AI won't take your job, a grant writer using AI will, and don't freak out. You don't have to be a first adopter. You're okay. I love that. I love that because there was a lot of panic. And, you know, I almost learned something a little bit more through the PTA lens, which can apply to this as well Is it's um, really when we broke it down, it was the way what was happening was like a Maslow's theory, right? A Maslow's hierarchy of thinking. Yeah. And it was like, are we going to jump over some processes if this is just utilized, if we don't have any boundaries around this, or if we don't have any way to talk about it. You know, there's like the whole, like some schools are just banning it completely and other ones are just like, they're, you know, so it was like, let's come up with like um, a way that, you know, it was actually one of the things that we talked about was saying, we actually need a, a ethics and technology class then to actually talk about how to use it and how to think about it and more of the thinking and teachers are going to have to start asking different types of questions and testing in different ways. So I think it's really going to spin a lot of things on the side. You know what I mean? Like, I, I really do think it's going to be in a good way, though, because I think we've been, you know, it's the age of technology, but now all of a sudden it's, the, it's a different age we're moving into because of it. So it's more about thinking and concepts, conceptual age is what I think I've heard most recently, the conceptual age that we're moving into. So I thought that was kind of cool. And I really liked, um, you know, thinking about it that you can you can utilize it. But like you said, there is that fear of panic there. A lot of people are panicking. And I kind of just, I was like, well, the future's here. <laughs> oh my gosh, I wasn't prepared I'm for it. I'm too, I'm too young. Yeah. yeah. But I, I think it's just so important to, to just name what our feelings are around it to bring yeah. them even to light because sometimes we don't even realize what they're doing to our subconscious and yeah. if it's not this it could be something else how do we think oh, we yeah. we felt about the internet there was just exactly. as much panic right yeah. so yeah. um I, I do think that's a helpful activity just to name the name the feeling identify I if it's that. true and move through with cautious uh yeah. open heartness okay yeah so let's Let's pivot and talk about the nonprofit consulting conference that you and Mandy Pierce are organizing. Can you tell me what is the origin story of that event? Oh man, so yeah, it's so good because we were just talking. I think Mandy and I were in one thing that we had never really even met before, but it was just like we were in a group thing that was doing this back in the day, like a fundraiser or um, it was about fundraising on Facebook groups, something like that. And somebody else had organized it. They had invited us in there, kind of a thing just to be experts or talk one day or something. So I knew her and, and we had talked a few times to be like, how could we maybe work together? And then this idea, I've just had this idea for a while. Like I want to have something for nonprofit consultants. I don't really feel like there's a lot out there. I really want to start talking about a lot of the things that we talk about as far as raising your rates, value-based pricing, um, women in the industry, because as the majority of us are, <laughs> yeah, so real. who's attracted to freelance grant writing, grant writing agencies? Um, women, right? So a lot of us, um, and you know, there, we have a lot of like fear and trauma related with pricing, but and related to money, but what are we doing? We're focusing our energy on getting money. And then we also have to charge rates. Like it's a lot about, there's so much, you know, intertwined that I thought, man, we really need to elevate this space and talk about it. So we came together and we also were with Mazarin Trays last year. And that was a lot of fun. So we actually launched it last year in 2022. We had such a great response um, from folks out there. They were so ready for it. Um, so we decided, yeah, Mandy and I decided to do it again this year. So we're really excited excited about it still getting great responses of course and now we have more time to for the runway as well because last year I think we decided in May and then you know just went forward it off. <laughs> like let's yeah. do it yeah so this year yeah. we've been able to like from the, the basically the end of the conference we started planning for 2023 already so that's been awesome we already have a ton of people registered sponsors like yourself so we're really excited that Land Grant Writing is a sponsor and um, yeah we're just really excited to offer um, our theme this year is how to know when to grow um, your nonprofit consulting business so we're really looking at growth um, but it is for newbies and seasoned nonprofit consultants. So it's all the way the, the spectrum, if you will. We have stuff for everyone. We have networking as well. It's a two day event, August 23rd and 24th of 2023 online. Love so it. 
Yeah. Yay! Yes, we are proud sponsors of this event, so we'll make sure that registration links are below, especially before prices go up. So be sure if you're interested in going, go get signed up. We're really pumped for that. Okay, so let's pivot and talk about doing a side-by-side -side comparison on our programs. I know that we're a one-trick pony and we only have the collective, but you actually have many. But I want to yeah. talk about, let's talk about your, like your freelance mastermind or masterclass program. I'm not exactly sure what you call it. Let's start with that. What would you, what is the name of your grant writing consulting training program? Sure. So we actually are pivoting into two. And by the time this comes out, we'll probably have the two. So we're really excited because we've had, we've had like layers, like you say, we have like our grant writing master course, right? Which is an on-demand course. And occasionally I used to do it live as well, like a six week live training. Um, and then we also have a online course as well, which I also used to do it live <laughs> too sometimes, right? On how to start your freelance grant writing business. And then, so that's a freelance grant writer academy. And then we have our grant professional mentorship, which was our annual like full on support for growing your business. So we're definitely keeping that one there. So that's a little bit more like you already have your business set up. You really want to grow it, um, but you want continued support because we know in that way we, we do need community. We need feedback systems. We need that support, right? And then I realized that with even the freelance grant writer academy, the how just to even start your business, those folks also needed that that annual support. So I'm building that up as a separate um, community, but also as a tie-in community, then once they get their businesses set up, they can pivot into the mentorship um, to scale their businesses. Um, so yeah, we definitely have a lot for them as far as like, you know, here's how, here's all the business models, here's all the information, the resources, templates, all of the things, but also that support system, right? So we do a lot of um, coaching throughout the year as well, which is fantastic. And so- How do you do your coaching? I'd love to unpack that. How do you yeah. do your coaching exactly? Like, how does it run? Yeah, so in the mentorship program, we actually have a very structured quarterly approach. So every, every single month throughout the year, we just have like a hot seat coaching call, right? And then the first month of every single quarter, we do an accountability call. So you have to bring your quarterly goals and you have to reflect, you do your wins from the last quarter, you do what's your quarterly planning and how that aligns with your, your annual goals. And so we have that. And then the second month of the quarter, we do our masterclass. So it's something where how to advance your business, how to hire a VA, whatever that is, right? Those kind of things, like really more the teaching. And then the third quarter, or the third month of the quarter, we have our book club. So we also have two books that we read every single quarter, a professional development growth and a personal growth. So uh, we focus on that, we, we riff on what we learned from that. So yeah, so then we, and then every single, so we meet twice a month and we always have the hot seats consistently, but then we kind of just alternate the rinse and repeat of the quarters for those other more structured calls. So that makes yeah. a lot of sense. So does, is the, course training portion separate from that? Yep, it's totally okay. on demand. So um, they can get into it whenever they want. There's all of the videos. Um, and I do try to keep them pretty short. Like I have a, a lot of them for different, like we have their different modules, right? So right. if you want the pricing module and then we have like five to seven minute videos about like how to do whatever proposal, da, 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 you know, and we break those down. Right. So they're very easy to digest as well. And then we right. have workbooks that go with that and all of that. Um, another component that I really like within our coaching too is we do feedback. So people can um, send in any grant they're working on. They can send in, you know, before they send it to a client, we'll do a review and send back um, a review and feedback on that. If they want to send a proposal before they send it to a client or just their website, they want to get some feedback, anything, they yeah. can also get that feedback. And that's so important. So we, we call that our feedback system loop, right? So that way they can really feel more confident. So yeah, it's definitely, we have the business structure, the business model of the feedback system, and then our mindset for, yeah, unshakable confidence <laughs> to get out there. No, I love this. Okay, so let's break it down a little bit further. So yeah. we also do routine to basically twice a month coaching calls. So we're sharing that. And then um, your feedback loops, how are they giving that information to you? And what is the kind of the turnaround on that? And do you have other coach support? Because that's a lot if that's all on you. Yeah, so we are definitely bringing in some coaches because <laughs> yeah, it's getting, it's like so much going on. So I have some coaches to bring in and doing the training. And then that way we, we also um, have 72 hours turnaround. 
So we do need time in advance. It's not like next day even. We, we have offer some, I mean, sometimes we do get to it then, but not always, right? right? So we, uh, but at 72 hours, we will get to turn around. So especially on grants and stuff like that, they can be a lot, right? So we definitely want to have the time. We will not write the grants. We do a recording in Loom and send it back mm -hmm. so they can see our feedback that way. So we don't do written feedback. We also just do video recording feedback as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Loom is yeah. game changing if it would just stop crashing all the time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's amazing though. It's like, oh my it gosh, is. I use it all the time. Like <laughs> anything, right? It's like, even yeah. like a VA has a question. I'm like, here I am going on Loom and just showing you and sending it to you. Like it saves so exactly. much time. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We feel the same way. I just need them to stop crashing. Uh, okay. So what is your community group in? Where is it housed? So we are housed on, so all of the on-demand courses are in Teachery, which is an online platform. Um, and then we are actually transitioning into Slack as well. So then we were there so we can just do more of the feedback within Slack. And then, of course, we meet on Zoom. So it's pretty simple. It's, you know, everything's pretty simple and how they can get information. Um, and then, of course, email, we communicate that way too. So, yeah. We don't cool. do any. Um, yeah. You're going to. Oh, sorry. Uh, we have a Facebook group. We had, we did, we actually okay. did. And I closed that down last, the beginning of this year. I just closed it down recently. And that was for more of just anyone who's bought any of my courses. Cause I have a lot of different sure. courses and I would do a once a, once a month Facebook live, but I just, I didn't have the energy and just Facebook. I'm not on Facebook. Like, I mean, I think I have a presence there that automates from link or from Instagram, but I don't actively go on. So I was like, I just have right. to shut this down. This part's closing, but I did open a, a LinkedIn group just for my mentorship, a private one. And part of the reason we did that so we could also, it was more about some people weren't on LinkedIn and they wanted to learn how to use it. So that we're just yeah. doing it kind of the beta right now. I don't know if we'll keep it long term, but it was more just like getting people on there, getting them comfortable, having them easily be able to share things on LinkedIn with other yeah. people as well, you know, hype each yeah. other up for sure. Yeah. Yeah, leaving Facebook two year two and a half years ago was one of the best things we ever did for our business, for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. We weren't even that large at that time. I don't know how many members we would have had, but it was getting to the point that like you would just lose conversations because it's just a feed and um, it just wasn't a very positive experience. It certainly doesn't feel like what you should be doing at work, right? Mm -hmm. And so we shifted over to Circle which were a huge fan of that platform. I don't know if you've used them in any other you know, capacity. I haven't. No, I have. I've heard of them. I've definitely heard of them. Um, yeah. But yeah, I haven't. I haven't used them. But I've heard they're really good. It's kind of like um, Mighty Networks. Have you used them as well? But so much better. I've okay. tried everything. I've used Slack. I've used Mighty Networks. I've used Facebook groups. Like I've done it all. And Circle is our happy place. It's sort of like if Slack and Facebook made an ethical ad-free baby. That is Circle. Okay. And so what we like about it is that you can have channels for having conversations. So you can have different places for advanced grant writing questions or yeah. introductions or wins or the random channel is fun, right? So uh, yeah. announcements, like when we do get requests for grant writing jobs, we'll post it in the opportunities channel so people can all right. see that and respond if they want. So yeah, we love we love that. But I love that you're looking at like even Slack for your group is great. Like oh, yeah. Slack is a very professional um, yeah. plot, a way to communicate. It just wouldn't, I think Slack would have killed us if we'd done that with like our size of community that we have. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. Would have been insane, but like for the right size, it's amazing. And I think it helps people feel a strong sense of community, even seeing that little green light on to just know that mm -hmm. you're not working solo. Yeah, absolutely. That's so refreshing, right? So yeah. Mm -hmm. I love okay, that. I think we also have basically the same price for our program. What is your price point? So, and that one is, um, it's going to be similar, right? We are also going to have our Slack channel. We're going to have reviews, but it's really going to be focusing on just how to get started, right? Just how to get started that first year of business, like boom. And um, that one's 2,500 for the year. And then our mentorship right now is 5K, but that price will be going up as well. So that one's a little bit more for more advanced people. It's really getting into more systems to scale and that sort of thing. And there's a lot more kind of with me in that program as well. So we'll definitely be increasing the price right now is 5k yeah for that one so yeah. cool yeah I, it's, it's, like that. it's like what's the price today 
we took us six months or maybe even a year too long to increase the price of the collective. We were we were way too low for too long for the delivery that we were offering. Like it was it was really just starting to hit like a breaking point. So yeah, we just increased the price of our program to five hundred dollars a month, or that's six thousand a year. And yeah, my big deal is like I'm gonna make you that money back. Not yep. once, oh, yeah. not twice, not three times over, as many times over as you want to. So um, yeah, that was huge. And then how we ended up dealing with the, like dealing with our thriving shining stars that are crushing it, that need more support, that have existing grant writing consulting businesses. It's very early stage, but we basically just broke off this little 5% club mastermind. Yeah. And it's so 5% club, meaning people that have made hundred K in revenue and and we do a once a month call with them. It's it's more casual, tables open, you can bring anything you want, and there's a lot of peer support in there as well, which I love. And yeah. so I don't know how that's gonna grow up over time, yeah. but I do love talking about business, and so it's been really fun to give them their own advanced training on how do you hire, how do you, yeah, to your point, scale on operations and systems and get SOPs in place and all of that. So yeah. um, that's, it's definitely a little bit of an experiment for our and more advanced crushing it grant writing consultants. But my goal is to get everyone that's new into phase six, into that 5% yep. club as soon as possible. Yep. So I'm sure I you have the same it. vision for your new, new. Yeah. Piece. And I, yeah. And that's where the mentorship, I think where I have decided to do the two programs too, is to bring them to that place too, right? Where we can talk exclusively about that, like your 5% circle, right? It's that same, right. like, we need to like talk a little bit different here because we don't want to overwhelm the other folks. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot going on, right? There's a lot like, oh yeah, just you opened your doors yesterday and you're like, oh my gosh, now I got to like hire a million people. Say, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. Right. Like, calm down. But if I right. get all this work, what am I going to do and how to handle yeah. that? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I feel like all of our, both of our programs and there's just so much sometimes behind the scenes that we actually can't even communicate it all outwardly because it would take too long. So I call those the little surprise Easter eggs that are within the program that are adding a little delight factor. So what would you say, unless you need to keep them secret, what would be some of your little surprise Easter eggs you'd say that are that, that delight bonus for your members? Yeah, I mean, I love it. I love that um, I also have a platform like you, right? So we have our podcast so they can be featured on there and they can get the word out through there. We have all of the little things, even like our little swag this year was a, you like this maybe, little cowbell. So yeah. We have her, yeah. So when you get a client, you ring your bell. <laughs> so it's a lot of fun. And yeah, just like, so on our calls, everyone's like, ding, 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 like ringing their bell. And, you know, just like little things like that. Like we always try to switch up the swag just to keep it fun. But I'm really big into like gongs or bells or like those, like, let's share our wins. And that's where we start with every conversation is I'm like, I need at least, I need three wins before we get started today. Like, boom, who's got to win? Yeah. Boom, boom, yeah. boom. And it's so fun just to... Yeah to feel that. So yeah, a lot of the little sidesy things is we also bring in guest speakers sometimes, which is a lot of fun just to kind of like yeah. shake it up. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we just throw in little things like that where we're like, hey, what do you guys feel like you need right now? Like what's going on and right. listening right. to the community, right? And then throwing in some, yeah. some things to help out with that. So that's always fun. Yeah, definitely. I, I can relate to that. I've always said this from the very beginning, no one person can know it all. And so whenever we do hear a theme that's emerging, we will go find an expert to bring that in. So I'd say our most recent surprise Easter egg, literally delivered on Easter, was a uh, DEI training for grant writers. So to specifically raise our own awareness as individuals so that we can do our work better, we uh, hired the Liberation Lab to put that training together. Incredible educator that I'm just, it's incredible. It's a fantastic training. So that was kind of cool. So every National Unicorn Day, because that's obviously sort of our mascot, we'll celebrate with something. Last year we did Pen to Polished. It was a writing training for grant writers because a lot of people just felt like, actually, I never really got trained in how to write. Yeah. Which is yeah. completely relatable. I feel like I was self-taught hack job. Um, and then I'd say like our other Easter eggs have been, we mail people swag, which is really just because Alex and I love to get packages at different milestones. So when they make their first 1,500, 15,000, 50,000, and 100,000, or land a full-time salary job, we will mail them, you know, this cute little, what's it called? Like mouse pad or oh, nice. the, 
or a a mug that's made by a local potter uh, that has Mm -hmm. a unicorn on it or the thousand dollar hundred thousand dollar one is like a custom unicorn hoodie that fits you um so sometimes just having yeah that's awesome (laughs) i've seen you on instagram i think yeah yeah they're really fun we wear them all the time so yeah yeah, i think those those little surprise easter eggs are fun because you just never you know someone has something hard happen too, like just to mail them a little package to say like hey we're here with you like we're really sorry for what you're going through or whatever i think it just adds that human touch that's important so Oh yeah. And there are ups and downs to businesses for anyone. Like, you know, and it's one week you might have a high because you signed on clients. And then two weeks later you have a low because you're having boundary issues with them or whatever. And you know what I mean? Like things happen or things happen in your life. And, you know, so it's, you know, you might be really excited about this VA and three weeks later, like, oh my gosh, is adding more work on my plate now? this VA. So it's like, you know, and, and getting things in the mail. I love that because getting things in the mail is so special, right? Like, or just like an email, like, Hey, are you doing okay? Like just touching base. Right. You know, like yeah. just those kind of things are amazing. So I love that. Yeah. That's so awesome. do you do any live events or ever meet up with your customers anywhere? I haven't yet. Um, you are I'm, far, far away. <laughs> In yeah. <Guam. laughs> yeah. I am super far. Like, um, so it's, it's a lot to organize. And when I do travel, it's a lot with my daughter's activities and that sort of thing. So it's just a lot to organize, but, um, definitely maybe in the future, you know, even just, it's fun. Even if I go to the States, sometimes if I'm in the same area as somebody, we can meet up that way, but it's never like a, you know, like a conference or something, but even here in Guam, it's like, sometimes we don't travel to the States. Like last summer we went to Portugal, right? Like we, we go this way, we go to Japan or we go somewhere else. Like, so yeah, we're not in the States, like physically very often. So yeah, right. they can, yeah. Other people no, are doing, really they're doing them everywhere. They're doing them internationally I mean, too, but yeah. Right. I yeah. mean, Guam is far away and I would say Alaska often feels that way too. We feel like an island sometimes. Yes. So yeah. for sure. Yeah. We, um, we had our very first retreat last fall where nice. there was 25 or so of us. We got together in Sedona. We're, we'll do our next event in Alaska because that's like dream, dream come true. That'll be next summer. Nice. Um, and then, yeah, we've, we've kind of created, whenever Alex and I travel, if we have to go somewhere for a work event, we'll just organize a little meetup. And it's cool because there's now getting to be enough of a, there's enough people pretty much everywhere <laughs> that you can really go anywhere in the States, potentially even abroad in many locations and you can gather people. So, um, yeah. yeah. So I think like the next meetup that's happening is in Ohio this summer. So oh, you're in Ohio, right? So it's, yeah, that, that part's kind of fun, but I do rec- like, I agree. Like the beauty of this is that you can actually still connect with people and have a huge mm-hmm. impact on their lives and do it from wherever you live. Yes, absolutely. It is a huge bonus. Like it's, it's nice. And it depends on what you like, you know, like a lot of people, they like that they like more time and, and I'm an author. So I'm working on books right now. You know, I, I want the space and the time to yes. do that. So it really helps with yep. that. So yep. yeah, That's it's huge. a lot of fun to really, yeah, say, how can I run this? How can I do it so I can operate more time, right, as well. Yep. And, and just coming back to that, because time is the most precious commodity, right, that we have. And it certainly is. It's, yeah. So it's like, how do I do that? And, and still, like, for me, it's like, I pick up my daughter after school, like, I, you know, drive her around or a dance, right. and I do all the things and can be present, you know, and can take off time when she's doing a musical. That was last week. <laughs> that, was, right. that was intense. So, you know, mm-hmm. to be able to have the things in place where you can still do that, um, yeah, it's really, it's exciting, you know? Yeah. 100%. So my, oh, the I book know. that I am a big fan of for that very topic of buying back your time is by Dan Martell, buy back your time. I don't know if you have a copy of that book yet. No, I don't. Yeah. yeah I'd highly awesome. recommend it. I actually bought a copy for all of my customers and such a big fan of this book and what it means to actually buy freedom, whether it's even just getting help with someone going to Costco for you or like filling up, cleaning your car, like whatever it is, it's like buying back time for you is so Mm -hmm. invaluable because the fallacy that we can do it all is just that a fallacy. And we all need help no matter what you're doing in your business and life. And so I just love that you've really carved out what you said you went to do in the very top of the hour, which was having more freedom and time with your daughter and you're doing it. So congrats. 
<laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This has been so much fun. I love looking at your business too and seeing how you've done things because it is right. You're right. It's like you're in Alaska. It's very similar. People think it's so separate, but geographically, we're both very isolated in many ways mm-hmm. from you know a lot of our clients and our customers and our people but we're not because we're online so there's like the I mean I think that. being isolated was our competitive edge because yeah. Yeah. when right when COVID hit I was actually out in a community of 4,000 people super rural gets 25 feet of snow on average like a very harsh country and nothing going on therefore nothing to distract me yeah I didn't yeah. have socials to go to. I didn't have conflicting events like I did in the big city. Anchorage, I'm saying, is the big city here, where it was hard to build a business and also attend to all the other demands. And so I do feel like a big part of our competitive edge in those like building days when you're just trying to create something from your imagination was being in a remote place. So there is something to, if you feel like you want to build something, folks, like don't be afraid to go rent an Airbnb in the forest and just go have some quiet work time. That's amazing. That's how I felt too. It it also, I think it gives me the drive to scale, to reach other people, to, you know, and because I have to creatively think like, I don't want to wake up at 2 a.m. to do this thing. So how can I reach people in a different way? Or I know like physically I can see like there's this many people here. How do I go outside? Right. So even my podcast, that was one of the reasons I started that. And it was like, you know, just do it, right? Do it scrappy, do it from the beginning. That was a little hundred dollar challenge I had with somebody who said, just, you know, start a podcast and I I can start a hundred dollars at the end of the month. And I was like, okay. So, you know, but having that drive, yeah, to be like, I am isolated. So how can I do this? And to actually think about it. Right. So I think, yeah, definitely that's been, that's been an advantage actually. So yeah. Oh, I love that. Yay. Mm-hmm. Okay. I knew there was one more thing I wanted to ask you, Holly, and now it's escaping me. Oh, okay. Final question. Here we are. What is your vision for the next five years of your business? Oh, wow. That's a big <laughs> loaded, loaded, <laughs> yeah, oh, no. loaded question. So, you know, when I look at this, I really look at, um, having scaling. Yes. My business, having more people in my programs, and really having a really solid team operating that and generating more books. So I am also looking at kind of revising another business I had, which is my, I do romantic comedy novels and having that really set up and running as well and having the time and space to work on that business too, because that is just such a part of my heart, right? That I really want to have out there and and be, be writing more creatively. So really having the systems really set up well so I can serve the people um, really well and also have this other business also set up and thriving so I have more um, books coming out as well on that level. So yeah, I definitely like writing more nonfiction books, but I love fiction books. That's really where my heart is totally settled. So Yay. yeah, that business or revising it. I had started it, but it's kind of taken a back seat. <laughs> So I'm like, it's got to come back. So yeah, really. And the only way way. is with systems. So I appreciate that. That's where you're leveling up. I completely agree. The reason we have the business we have today is because of our systems. And I think the best example of when it just was totally working out as you could ever dream would be last August, Alex took a month off my co-founder for a sabbatical and I was taking off like three weeks to get married. Same time. And we just lost the person that mails all of our swag, all of that, those gifts I was telling you about. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's actually logistically complex to do that. Like there's a lot of different systems to check, to know like who to mail what and when, and how do you do it? Right? Like it's, it's actually not the simplest of gigs. We ended up hiring someone and she was onboarded completely within three days because of the SOPs that outlined um, exactly what to do yeah. and a clear point of contact to ask any clarifying questions. And so there you go. Like we had someone literally onboarded of no effect at all on us being able to take time away from the business to live our lives. So it was, I think it just goes to show that like it is there, it can happen and it is the best thing that can happen. Even if you're just a brand new nonprofit consultant, hire someone to start managing your inbox. Like yeah. you can start a lot sooner than you might think. And just little things, right? So it's like the little things that can really help out. 
just it, it can really make yeah. a huge difference. And I know like there's a lot of proponents too that are like, you, it doesn't have to be for your business even. It can be for, yeah, your, exactly. business. It can be for your life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right there. <laughs> you know, oh, so yeah. And yeah. I am finally, I'm like, I, okay, I'm like, I'm finally like, okay, I'm going to get a driver to help in the afternoons with my daughter. Sweet. You know what I mean? Like, cause yeah. even though I do like to be there, but sometimes it is like, oh gosh, now I have to set this off to the side and I just want to finish, you know? Right. And, right. you know, so I was like, yeah, it's like, okay, how you can do that. You know, cause yeah. there's a lot of fear around that, like with who's going to yeah. pick her up and all of those things. But it's like right. you, moving through that and working on that can really help. Right. So it's like yes. the little things can make a huge difference. So yeah, totally. Uh, my goal is to find someone to process all my mail. Oh, I just hate yeah. it. Opening <laughs> envelopes, dealing with the things that are like, oh, a medical bill that needs paid and then I forget about it or whatever. So I'm like, I want someone to just manage all my mail and I never have to touch any of it. That's like my next, you know, next there big girl go. goal. I love it. I love it so much. Oh, so good. Okay. So Holly, let's wrap this up. Thank you for sharing your vision. I love that you're, you're going to be carving out more space for your writing and yeah. anything we can do to help promote that as well, as well and support you with building systems. I think um, I'll share our vision real quick because it's also That's a little cool. bit nebulous. Yeah, so this thankfully came to be. We did a vision board workshop as part of National. I saw that. I love vision yeah. boards. Oh my gosh! I was like, "Yes, girl, you go." Yeah. They're the best. It was like, so yeah. fun. It was so fun, and so that was when a bunch of downloads came, and I realized like how cool would it be to have offices in these amazing places like Honolulu and Taos, New Mexico. Kind of not like your super expensive cities, but the a little less. Yeah. Where you, we have remote grant writers, like they want to travel, they want to experience life. So like, go to one of these epic co-working spaces, but sort of a stay and work environment. So there's like an Airbnb rental above mm -hmm. these co-working space for our grant writers because I think that human connection is just invaluable. So mm -hmm. I can just imagine like a building where there's like huge confetti that's like looks like it's been thrown across the building from the outside, just so it like yes. makes a statement too, like what goes on inside that building. And then yeah. everyone knows like, this is where you get grant writers. Yeah. Yes. So I love that. That's kind of like something we're excited about and wanting to figure out like, how do we do that? How do we get into being, yeah. you know, property developers? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. I mean, yeah, let me know if you're looking at Honolulu. I know some people out there. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, we're just getting yeah. started on that. We just have a team member out there and we're like, okay, we need to find a realtor. So yeah, yep. cool. Yeah, okay, well, this has been an amazing side by side. Is there, where can our listeners go learn more about you and specifically the nonprofit consultant conference coming up? Yes, they can definitely go to grantwritingandfunding.com. We have all of the links there. Um, and then we have nonprofitconsultingconferenceonline.com as well for the conference specifically. Super excited about it. So if you guys are looking to start or grow a nonprofit consulting business, you're definitely going to want to check out that two days of amazing just so many speakers and networking and swag and it's going to be so much fun so definitely come join us there you'll see meredith yeah. too so. yeah we'll yeah. be there too cheering on yeah. in the side woo okay thank you holly for your time and we'll catch you next time thank you so much